Hi everyone, welcome to Big Cat Conversations, and here we are with episode 100. And as you can hear, I'm not alone. We're in a pub in deepest Herefordshire, amongst the cider orchards, and there are 25 people gathered around, friends and allies and Big Cat witnesses, people who are boots on the ground, investigators, and people who are interested in trail cameras and thermal cameras and recording cats if they can, speaking to landowners, and then the cultural aspects of Big Cat. So a real mixed gathering of people. We've got some Big Cat witnesses, I think, and we've got three up front for interviews coming up in a moment. Later on, we've got more discussion points about um, tracking Big Cats and the cultural aspects of Big Cats and what we make of the whole mystery and where we go in the future. So a lot of ground to cover. Thanks to everybody listening back home across the world to this podcast and thanks to everybody in the room because um, we're a big community on this and it's so nice with episode 100 just to have a chat in the pub we thought actually it's the people's podcast let's just go to a pub and have a friendly conversation and listen to more witnesses so first up is actually a very important guy because he was the person who suggested more than anybody that i ought to damn well do a podcast and listen to the witnesses Six months after he'd made the recommendation, thought, yeah, and I've got a son who does audio. It's all lining up, actually. So, David th- Smith, thank you very much. First sighting, I, I'd been out shooting. I was on my way back up to the, the car in a bit of a valley. There was woods both sides of me, and all the sheep from the right started to run across in front of me, right in front of me. They weren't bunching up. They were scattered, all running for their lives. So curiosity what what are they running from so i looked across and there was one sheep by itself over by the fence pig netting fence two strands of barbed wire on the top and i looked across and there's a sheep so i brought the scope up why isn't it running it was a puma plain outright puma you could see it as plain as a pike star through the scope there was no doubt um I didn't shoot because I'd only got a two-two rim fire, so it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have even injured it properly. <laughs> um, so that that was a big eye Now I didn't really believe in big cats until then. About five six years later, I saw another cat. I was out walking the dogs. We were walking through a black currant patch. I was on the headland. The dogs were both rabbiting off in the bushes, and this was probably August, September time, so fruit was on, heavy leaf, couldn't see anything. But I heard one of the dogs coming back, and it ran straight out of the row in front of me. This is about 11 o'clock at night. Ran out about six feet in front and took off up the headland. And I thought, she's obviously out of rabbit. A few seconds later, she ran out again. And I'm thinking, hang on. That's slightly smaller. What's that? That was the actual dog. I switched the torch on. That was my actual dog, one of them. German Shepherd, and she was smaller than what she was chasing. I followed up quickly. The, the uh, My lurcher came out as well, and she was off in hot pursuit of the, both of them. And they started barking at the bottom of an apple tree in the hedge, and I put the, put, put the light on and a big torch, and I put it on the cat and as i got nearer and nearer it was looking down at the dogs and then up at me back to the dogs and up, and it did this all the way i was walking to it for about 70 yards i got within 15 yards and it took one final look at me and it turned and just jumped out of the tree over the other side of the hedge and fence and off down an orchard um there's no two ways about it it was a, a big black leopard Brilliant. Thanks ever so much, David. Sit there and we'll have you cross-examined in a minute. And uh, next person is Fleur. Fleur was based at British Museum, uh, where she uh, saw many um, symbols and um, signs of big cats in culture and folklore there. And she'll tell us a bit about that later on. So she had that sort of interest. But you're, you're going to talk us through your two main sightings in Dorset and in Oxfordshire. So thank you, Fleur, for coming along. I went... Um on numerous occasions to Arn on the Isle of Purbeck to do bird watching and look at the wildlife and so forth. And this was a sighting near Corfe Castle. Um, I managed to pinpoint it on the map afterwards and um, it was one of the classic road 
cat, big cat crossing the road at dusk scenarios that we've heard um, lots of instances of in the in the podcasts. So it's unfortunate that the detail isn't crystal clear because we were in a moving car, but both myself in the passenger seat and my friend uh, who was holidaying with in the driving seat both saw it. She first said, there's a cat, and I looked up. She'd watched it come out of the hedge on the left-hand side, traverse the road, not not too fast and, and reasonably far away. I immediately looked up and we both watched it cross the rest of the road to the right, go up through the vegetation and disappear. And we parked up and discussed the sighting. We were both quite shaken. I said, what do you think that was? Um, and she said, Black Panther, it looked like a Black Panther. She said about the size of a spaniel, which, and I was thinking, a little bit taller than that, I thought more like a medium-sized deer. What I was aware of very much was the thick back legs and a sort of raised bit at the back of the uh, at the back and a sort of mobility to it as it slunk through the vegetation. So those are my Dorset sightings. Every time I go back, we're looking like we can at, at any possibility of seeing the cat. Thanks ever so much, Fleur. We have a gate crasher, and we're delighted to have a gate crasher because as we were setting up, Nick, who's just joined us now, came to us and said, um, what's going on here? Can I join in? And we said, well, it depends. And he's a local witness and a recent witness, so he definitely can join in. So, Nick, thanks ever so much for coming in literally at the last second. And sock it to us. What have you got to tell us? I'm a very keen country walker. On the 19th of May, I was walking from Hay on Wye. Um, not far from the centre of the, the, the town, um, there was a, a, a fence to my left-hand side. I was walking a short distance from the fence, walked to the corner of the field where there was a field gate, and I saw something move. J just, I, I couldn't tell what it was. Um, I, I didn't dream it was anything special, um, but I went through the field gate closed it behind me and turned to my left. Um, two metres in front of me was the, 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 fen the field fence and I had a clear view uh, 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 of no obstructions at all. This beast leapt from my right-hand side from foliage across a clear view in front of me and disappeared to my left. It was astonishing. It was two metres away from me. It was reddish brown. It was the size of a large Labrador. Um, it was sleek. It had I incredible markings on it um, that were either dark brown or black and were regular, more square, peculiarly, that, that, than, than round. I only saw its body, which mesmerised me. It just shot across in front of me. It was, I, I was in awe of, of, of what I saw. It was just incredible. It was a once in a lifetime thing. Um, and I, I, I now know without any shadow of a doubt that there are big cats here. Sighting these magnificent animals, and, I, and I've seen a few of them, has it affected how you enjoy the countryside? And do you now turn into looking for spore and signs everywhere you go? Or can you, can you just enjoy a walk? Or are you genuinely concerned that you might bump into one of these cats? The, the, the impression I had from the big cat I saw was that it was a, a lot more wary of me than I was of it. I often go back to the same walk a bit, perhaps doing it in the reverse direction. And I will go back to Hay on Wye and who knows, I might be lucky again, but um, I, I, I suspect not. I, I, I think that was a, a once in a lifetime to be that close and to be that sure of what I've seen. Um, I, it's just wonderful. That one that was following me, if he wanted me, he'd have, he'd have had me. Yeah. The speed they move. And where I, I had to go through a narrow gap and if he'd really been preying on me, he'd, he'd have had me. So curiosity or just... Pacing I think a lot of it's curiosity and po possibly a young cat weighing up, what's he about, what's he doing? I mean, they're moving at about 25, 26 metres per second in the full charge. 
So I'm not sure how close you were to, to that leopard. 50 feet from the edge of the ward. So, so that's a second. So one, yeah. one second yeah. if it wanted to three ambush four, you. Three or four bounds and you'd have been on yeah. me. Usually they're just more curious. So it could be a young sub-adult animal that's looking, just sizing up what's going on. Often people are walking with dogs and they're, they're not really interested in the person. They're interested in the dogs. So I, I think almost invariably they, they try and um, get away. So um, Nick's experience is a typical uh, experience of coming across a, a leopard at short distance. All you see is a blur of, of spots and, and, and colour. Gone. Can we just get a quick perspective from Alan? Because you run a, a Facebook group uh, in the for, for Forest of Dean area. You go out following up reports. You use a thermal camera. You, you hear reports. You listen to the podcast a bit. What do you reckon on what's happening and, or what, what we're learning from people's reports and the grapevine? What I'm learning through my Facebook group and through the sightings that are relayed to me and people getting in contact... I'm now working out territories and ranges. And for me, it's joining the dots. You know, the year before last, I had a sighting Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night. And it was a direct line. So you can kind of say, yeah, and that, help, that happens every year. And they didn't know of each other's reports? No, that was one of them actually, uh, I think it was the Friday night, actually got relayed to me about six months ago. So, yeah, you're always joining the dots when you're trying to figure out what they're doing. So but. Two summers ago, between us in Gloucestershire and the Facebook groups and amongst Frank Tunbridge's network of report uh, of uh, informants and mine, we got five credible lynx reports, all very detailed from people who hadn't a clue what a Eurasian lynx was in Forrester Dean and different parts of Gloucestershire and the Cotswolds. And I suddenly thought, yeah, they're all credible, and and they're in four different locations. You know, so there's possibly four links if we believe all those witnesses. And why shouldn't we? They were all very descriptive of the. So yeah, there you go. You know, was that four links is in Gloucestershire from 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 credible reports? It's now time for word of the week, and the word is going to be spore. Of course, we do have a very experienced tracker, trail guide with Mark Graves here. So Mark is going to lead us off for a dis quick discussion on spore. So Mark, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, spore, spelt S-P-O-O-R, uh, is actually the reason why it's not so well used here is it's actually an Afrikaans word. It means not just tracks as in footprints. It means any sign that will, or any evidence that will help you to uh, identify and follow an animal. Um, so you can have broken leaves or twigs that show where it's w walked. Um, we talked about smell, scent earlier. That would be spore. Um, if, an an if an animal is wounded, or indeed a person is wounded, you could follow b blood spore. So it it's any evidence that allows us to identify and then to follow and n uh, interpret, understand what that uh, animal or person that we are following is doing. Y yes, the environment is less uh, conducive to tracks and tracking here. Although having said that, it rains a lot and mud uh, provides a, a great medium for tracks. There is always sign. Nothing moves without leaving some sort of uh, an impression, some sort of sign, some sort of spore. Say we wanted to get more and better evidence, which we do, and you were individually given £5,000 sponsorship with no strings attached, what would you spend it on to get more and better evidence? If you, can, if you look at things like planet Earth, if you can get footage of a mother and her cubs, that is the ultimate emotive footage that will do the convincing in the minds of those people that hadn't given it thought before and will reach people in a way that a DNA evidence won't. So, yeah, I'd spend it all on cameras. I'd probably be looking at something like a starlight camera. Mm. Yeah, the ultimate, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you get one for five grand. But... I mean, what about a scat detection dog? Would anybody consider a scat detection dog? What do you think, Mark, from a South Africa perspective? Well, you could certainly train a dog to be species-specific. So yeah. it would be definitely possible to train, um, maybe repurpose a uh, a bloodhound or you know a mink hound or one, one of the old um, uh, scent hounds to specifically look for cats mm. um, and and they wouldn't just be scat I mean they, they you know they would they would they would find scent markings they would find any 
anything that that had that scent on it. Mm. Um, so sure. it would be possible. It cost, I think, probably again more than five thousand to train the dog, and then it's not just train the dog; it's the handler, it's the yeah. hand, the management. Yeah, it's not a part-time pet. No, I think I'm, I might no. take the money and go to the Malay Peninsula and see if I can see them in their wild environment and learn something. Good, uh, Nathan. But on that, then, instead of spending five k on cameras, spend five k on. I don't want to say bribes, but these people who have footage that sit on it that don't want to release it, if they've got a price and there's audio visual footage out there that exists, then go that way with the money as opposed to buying cameras. But again, those people won't do it for reasons you've covered before. Yeah, yeah. If you're going for 5K. Yeah, well, you know, I've been brokering uh, that sort of deal for, for people and tenant farmers why would tenant farmers who have filmed a puma release that information information they're sort of basically violating their agreement with their landlord so same with the gamekeeper you, your, your gamekeeper obviously has got a lot to lose david yeah. if he gives up that, that you know, those 30 pictures of a black leopard that are yeah. 10 feet away or whatever yeah. final few minutes that are left could we talk about this cultural aspect and why are we intrigued about these animals I'm doing tours of the British Museum on the subject of divine cat. And whether these are small cats, like the goddess Bast in ancient Egypt, or the lioness goddess, Sekhmet, the panther of Dionysus, uh, the ocelot, the jaguar of Mexico, the leopard of Africa, we have an absolute abundance of uh, cultures which have revered the feline in many forms, and have given it respect and have mythologised it, if you like. So the Roman villa at Spoonley Wood in Gloucestershire, um, excavated there probably um, in the early part of the 20th century, dug up a a large uh, statue about this high of the god of wine and ecstasy and dance, Dionysus, known uh, by the Romans as Bacchus, with his panther. That is from Gloucestershire. I thought that was pretty amazing. If everybody wants to come to the British Museum to see that, that's in the Romano British Upper Galleries, and you can meet the the panther. So do come and have a look at those. Splendid. I think we're going to wind down there because we're going to be kicked out of the pub in half an hour's time. So thanks, everybody, for contributing to our pub gathering for the 100th episode. Thank you to the listeners across the world. We are listened to in scores of countries across the world in every continent. It's so heartening that there is this wider interest. So thanks, everybody, for chipping in. Thanks to Owen and Max again. And we're off for some cake, and I think we're done. So thank you very much for joining in Big Cat Conversations. (laughs) And Max. Ha, ha, ha,